To keep yourself updated, subscribe to Indigo Learn and click the bell icon and download our app OneFin to start learning on the go. So friends, we are just done with the concept of section 7, 1, clause A. What is section 7, 1, A? Supply includes all forms of supply of goods or services or both such as sale, transfer, barter, exchange, license, rental, lease or a disposal made or agreed to be made for a consideration by a person in the course or furtherance of business. Now in this context my dear friends, let me tell you an interesting latest amendment which is very very interesting and very important for a simple reason because a lot of ambiguity in terms of this concept has been removed by virtue of this amendment which has been brought in by way of introduction of section 71 clause AA. We are just done with 71 clause A. We are talking about 71 clause AA. Now what is this 71 clause AA? Let me give a small example so that we get a clarity on this concept. Then we look at the actual provision. Come on friends. Now we all know the concept of club my dear friends. Take an example like Lions Club, Rotary Club, Country Club, whatever clubs you call it, this club is formed by the members. There are some set of members who come together and form a club. Correct? Now what does club do basically? The club provides services to the members out of the money that club has collected from the members. So technically, club is not doing any business activity. A club is basically is an organization or institution or some association which has been formed by the members for the welfare of its members. Now a big question has arised that is whether the transaction undertaken by the club for the benefit of members or transaction undertaken by members to the club is it a supply or not because they are clearly covered by the doctrine of mutuality. That means a club is formed by the members and club is giving service to its own members. So basically we have formed our own club to provide facilities to us. So there is no third person who is coming to the picture. But they have clearly clarified that as per section 7.1 clause AA. Activities or transactions undertaken by any person other than an individual to its members or its constituents shall be regarded as supply or it could be vice versa also that is activities or transaction undertaken by the members or constituents towards the club is also regarded as a supply so activities or transaction undertaken by any person other than individual to its members or constituents or vice versa shall be regarded as supply and the transaction could be for cash or deferred payment or for any other valuable consideration it is still regarded as supply by virtue of this amendment it has put an end to the long standing issue whether the service given by club to the members or members to the club whether it is supply or not that issue has been very clearly clarified now by virtue of this amendment stating that the transaction very well falls within the concept of supply. So finally, what is the concept? Activities or transaction undertaken by any person other than individual to its members or constituents or vice versa for cash or deferred payment or any other valuable consideration shall be regarded as supply. And the reason for that or the explanation for that is also very clear that members and the club are deemed to be distinct persons. Those both are not same persons. Members and club are deemed to be distinct persons. A very, very interesting amendment which is given by section 71 clause AA. This section 71 clause AA has been inserted retrospectively with effect from 1-7-2017. That is from the start of GST. So this is a retrospective amendment which has been inserted by virtue of inserting clause AA in section 7 subsection 1. So friends, we have just discussed some interesting concept that is in case of manufacture of some goods, they cannot take composition scheme. And by the way, my dear friends, 
please tell me what is the rate of tax in case of manufacturers for composition scheme the rate of tax is very clearly 0.5 percent plus 0.5 percent of the turnover an interesting concept we just discussed is that manufacturer of four types of goods cannot take composition scheme now what are those four we discussed number one pan masala number two tobacco and tobacco substitutes number three ice cream and other edible ice whether or not containing cocoa and number four aerated waters so these four manufacturer of these four goods cannot take composition scheme what are those four come on let's look at that again pan masala tobacco and tobacco substitute ice cream and other edible ice whether or not containing cocoa aerated waters now let me tell you my dear friends they have widened the list of this four to eight so let me indirectly tell you or directly tell you that four more goods have been added to this list by virtue of notification number four by 2002 dated 31st march 2002 wherein manufacture of another four goods also cannot take composition scheme now what are those four goods number one fly ash bricks or fly ash aggregate with 90 percent or more fly ash content or fly ash blocks second one bricks of fossil metals or siliceous earths and number three building bricks number four earthen or roofing tiles so these are the four more extra goods which have been added to the existing list of four making the total as eight wherein manufacture of these eight goods cannot take composition scheme number one pan masala number two tobacco or tobacco substitutes number three ice cream and other edible ice whether or not containing cocoa number four aerated waters number five fly ash bricks or fly ash aggregate with 90 percent or more fly ash content or fly ash blocks next one what is the next one my dear friends come on bricks of fossil metals or any other siliceous earths next one building bricks and what is the last one earthen or roofing tiles so these are the eight products for manufacture of these any of these eight products cannot take composition scheme under section 10 so friends we just discussed the interesting exemption what is the concept my dear friends pure services or a composite supply of service where the value of the goods is not more than 25 percent of the value of the contract when the service is given to central government state government union territory local authority or a governmental authority or a government entity in relation to a function interested to a panchayat or to a municipality shall be exempt correct my dear friends now in this context one interesting amendment which has come up that is they removed the words governmental authority and the government entity that means what that means exemption is given only when that pure service or that composite supply in relation to panchayat or municipality is given to central government state government union territory or local authority they removed that two words called governmental authority and government entity so if that service is given to governmental authority or government entity then it becomes taxable exemption is only when it is given to central government state government union territory or local authority so friends this three points what we just discussed now is covered by entry number 1515 what are three points number one a b c we discussed there a point deals with transportation of passengers by air embarking from or terminating in certain specified states and b point was talking about non-air conditioned contract carriage and the c point talks about stage carriage other than air conditioned stage carriage now in this context one interesting concept or interesting amendment what they have brought in here is that in case of b point and c point that is for stage carriage or non-air conditioned contract carriage GST will still apply that means exemption will not apply if services are supplied through an e-commerce operator and the reason for that is very clear 
सर्विस बाय वे ऑफ ट्रांसपोर्टेशन ऑफ पैसेंजर बाय वे ऑफ रेडियो टैक्सी और मोटर कैब और मैक्सी कैब और मोटरसाइकिल और ओमनी बस और एनी अदर मोटर व्हीकल थ्रू एन ई कॉमर्स ऑपरेटर देन ई कॉमर्स ऑपरेटर इज लाइबल टू पे जीएसटी so for that reason for this b point and c point that is contract carriage non ac and stage carriage these two cases gst will still apply that means no exemption will apply gst will apply if the service is supplied through an e commerce operator so friends in this entry number 17 or para number 17 Five interesting cases are covered. That is transportation of passengers by railways in a class other than first class or AC coach. Second point is metro monorail tramway. Third point is inland waterways. Fourth point is public transport. Fifth point is metered cabs or auto rickshaws. In these cases, it is straight away exempt from GST. But here, one interesting amendment which has come up is, my dear friends, if the service of transportation of passenger, in case of service of transportation of passenger by way of metered cabs or auto rickshaws, which is actually exempt, but if that service of transportation of passenger in a metered cab or auto rickshaw is supplied through an e-commerce operator, then definitely GST will apply. That means no exemption would apply. the reason for that is what we all know that is service of transportation of passenger by way of radio taxi motor cab maxi cab motor cycle omnibus or any other motor vehicle through an e-commerce operator then e-commerce operator is liable to pay gst so for this last e point that is meter cabs and auto rickshaws it is generally exempt but if that service is given through an e-commerce operator then that will be taxable so friends we just discussed the interesting amendment that is the recipient can claim credit only to the maximum extent of 105% of the credit reflecting in gstr to be so for the purpose of monthly availment of credit we are not concerned with gstr to a but we are concerned only with gstr to b and the credit will reflect in gstr to b only if supplier has filed his gstr 1 or iff within the due date if as filed after the due date it will come in to be of next month but not to be of this month now here let me tell an interesting concept we discussed just now that originally 20% was there as a buffer which has become 10% which has subsequently become 5% but now let me tell you my dear friends finance act 2021 has made an interesting further amendment to this and they inserted section 162 clause aa with effect from 1st of january 2022 and what is the interest amendment that has been brought that is pretty simple recipient please claim credit only that much which is reflecting in gstr to be that's it you cannot take anything more that means they have removed this relaxation of 5% also so the recipient what credit he can claim is only maximum 100% of credit reflecting in gstr to be so original 120% has become 110% which has subsequently become 105% but from 1st of january 2022 this concept has become only 100% so what credit can be claimed is only the credit which is reflecting in gstr to be now it has become way too much important that recipient has to reconcile the data on monthly basis keep on following up with the suppliers if the data is not reflecting in gstr to be because unless it comes in gstr to be recipient cannot claim credit there is no relaxation of 20% 10% 5% nothing credit can be claimed only if it is reflecting in gstr to be this is with effect from 1st of january 2022 and this is brought in by virtue of notification number 40 by 2021 dated 29th december 2021 a very very interesting and fantastic amendment what is the outcome or simple story of this credit that recipient can claim is 100% of credit reflecting in gstr to be that set 120% story is already gone 110 already gone it was 105 now 105 also is gone 
recipient can claim credit only maximum 100% of credit reflecting in GSTR to be come on my dear friends by understanding this concept we very clearly understood that other authentication is one such concept wherein a link would be sent to the email ID and the phone number given at the time of registration and the person at the time of registration when he clicks that link he will get an OTP to the mobile number registered in the other and once that OTP is entered other authentication is done it is a very simple process and the whole idea of the government is to ensure that the entire data can be tracked from other that's the whole idea why they brought this concept of other authentication now in this context let me tell you an interesting concept apart from the new registration they have specified in the law in section 25 that other authentication is required even for those persons who are already registered and nowadays let me tell you for registered persons also the moment we enter login id and password that is username and password a pop-up is coming please undergo other authentication now for whom this other authentication is required in case of a company managing director sole proprietor that particular proprietor and in case of a partnership firm the managing partner and along with these persons are and also for the authorized signatory this other authentication is required and let me tell you an interesting concept they brought in some rule known as rule 10b where they have specified that if the registered person fails to undergo other authentication for the authorized persons and the authorized signatory then they cannot file an application for revocation of cancellation or an application for any refund so application for any refund or the application for revocation of cancellation cannot be made if other authentication is not done and this concept will not apply to those who are exempt from obtaining other authentication but for others this concept will apply and in this context they have also specified that if any person does not possess an other then he must submit a proof of other application slip that he has applied for the other that particular slip along with a copy of a bank statement passbook or a voter ID or a passport or election voter ID card any of this document along with other application slip should be submitted and within 30 days from the date of obtaining other he must update his other and get the other authentication done the whole idea of introduction of all this process is to ensure that gst department will pick up the data from other and match with that corresponding data a very interesting concept and i already told you very clearly that if other authentication is not done for new registration they are taking more time to grant registration and they will grant only after physical verification of premises and the latest amendment what i just discussed with you is that other authentication is required even for those who are already registered that's an interesting concept so the concept is very clear that in nutshell other authentication is required for those who are applying for a fresh registration and it is also required for those who has already registered in case of a proprietor the for the proprietor it is required for the partnership firm for the partner it is required company managing director in case of a trust for the trustee it is required and also for the authorized signatory this other authentication is required and if the person has not obtained his other then he has to submit other enrollment slip along with any of the following document that is bank statement passbook with photo or driving license or passport or election voter id card and he must submit that is get other authentication done within 30 days from the date of obtaining other number So friends, I'm sure we got a good clarity on the concept of limits for registration where we clearly discussed that for four categories of states, special category, Manipur, Mizoram, Nagaland, Tripura, the limit is 10 lakhs and second box is Arunachal Pradesh, Meghalaya, Sikkim, Uttarakhand, Puducherry and Telangana, the limit is 20 lakhs whether engaged in goods or service or both. And last category is all other state where if you are engaged exclusively in supply of goods, then the limit is 40 lakhs. 
exclusively in supply of service, then the limit is 20 lakhs. For both, then also limit is 20 lakhs. So 40 lakhs limit will apply only if you are engaged exclusively in supply of goods. However, the 40 lakhs limit will not apply in case of pan masala, tobacco and tobacco substitutes, ice cream and other edible ice, whether or not containing cocoa. Now in this context, let me tell you my dear friends, there is an interesting amendment where they have added four more goods to this particular list where the limit of 40 lakhs will not apply. And my dear friends, come on, tell me clearly, if 40 lakhs will not apply, what will apply? Of course, 20 lakhs will apply. Because 10 lakh story will come only in case of special category states. Now what are these goods, my dear friends? First one was what? Pan masala. Second one, tobacco, tobacco substitutes. Third one, ice cream and other edible ice, whether or not containing cocoa. Now the four latest points they have added is, number one, fly ash bricks or fly ash aggregate with 90% or more fly ash content or fly ash blocks. Second point is bricks of fossil meals or similar silicious earths. Number three, building bricks. Number four is an interesting point that is nothing but earthen or roofing tiles, earthen or roofing tiles. So for these four goods also, the limit of 40 lakhs will not apply. If 40 doesn't apply, what will apply my dear friends? 20 lakhs limit will apply. So what are the four recently added? Fly ash bricks or fly ash aggregate with 90% or more fly ash content or fly ash blocks. And second one, bricks of fossil meals or similar silicious earths. And third one, building bricks. Fourth one, come on, what is the fourth one my dear friends? earthen or roofing tiles. So for these four products also, 40 lakhs limit will not apply. And if 40 doesn't apply, obviously 20 lakhs will apply. So my dear friends, as we just discussed, the concept of e-invoicing is applicable to those category of persons whose aggregate turnover during any of the preceding financial year starting from 1718 exceeds 50 crores. Now let me tell you my dear friends, one more interesting latest amendment has come up in this concept wherein the limit of 50 crores has been further reduced to 20 crores. So friends, let me tell you very clearly with effect from 1st April 2022, the concept of e-invoicing is applicable to those category of persons whose aggregate turnover during any of the financial year starting from 17-18 exceeds 20 crores. Then concept of e-invoicing is applicable from 1-4-2022. So the balance rest all concept of e-invoicing remains the same but the limit of 50 crores is now reduced to 20 crores. In fact, when this concept started, it was 500 crores. Then they brought it to 100 crores. Then they brought it to 50 crores. Now for our exam, it is 20 crores. And government has a plan very soon. They want to make it to 10 crores, 5 crores also. So that they'll cover everybody under the concept of e-invoicing. But from an examination standpoint, from the present practical standpoint, the concept is very simple that e-invoicing is applicable to those category of persons whose aggregate turnover during any of the preceding financial years starting from 17-18 exceeds 20 crores. Then with effect from 1st April 2022, the concept of e-invoicing is applicable. And as we all know, this concept of e-invoicing is only for B2B invoices. So in nutshell, my dear friends, the amendment is pretty simple that 50 crores limit is reduced to 20 crores. Rest all concept remains the same. Finally, let me tell you, my dear friends, that this concept of 50 crores reduced to 20 crores is brought in by notification number 1 by 2022 dated 24th February 2022. As I keep saying always to you, it's not mandatory that you have to remember the notification number, but during the course of discussion, I always explain with notification number so that you get a complete clarity of thought. In exam, section number writing adds a lot of value, but notification number writing is not mandatory. Don't worry at all. But while learning, while understanding the concept, ensure that you learn along with the notification number.
So friends, with this discussion, we are done with the concept of discussion on dynamic QR code applicable in case of B2C invoices and that too applicable only for those whose aggregate turnover during any of the preceding financial year starting from 1718 exceeds 500 crores. A very interesting concept. Now in respect to this dynamic QR code, my dear friends, two interesting clarification has been given by way of a circular. Clarification number one. This concept of dynamic QR code is applicable even in case of invoice issued to UIN holders. In registration topic, we discussed that a consulate or embassy or an agency of United Nations, they are granted unique identification number instead of GSTIN. So they are given a specific number known as unique identification number. And they have clarified very clearly that when supply is made to UIN holders, in that particular invoice, there should be a dynamic QR code. The reason for that is very clear that as per provisions of GST law, registered person does not include a person holding UIN, unique identification number. So that means when supply is made to UIN holders, it is regarded as B2C supply, but not a B2B supply. So for that reason, that invoice also should bear a dynamic QR code if their aggregate turnover exceeds 500 crores during any of the preceding financial year starting from financial year 17, 18. Next, second interesting clarification that is when supply is made to a person outside India, wherein place of supply of service is in India. Now, when place of supply of services in India, we all know the fact very clearly that it is not regarded as export of service. A transaction is regarded as export of service only when the place of supply of service is outside India. So, I am discussing a case where supplier is in India, recipient is outside India, a service is being provided for which place of supply of service is in India. Payment is received in convertible foreign exchange or Indian rupees wherever permitted by RBI. Now, in those cases, my dear friends, the invoice need not bear dynamic QR code. The logic for that point is very clear. That is, person outside India cannot make payment to the recipient using such dynamic QR code. For that reason, that kind of invoices need not have a dynamic QR code on the invoice. So these are the two interesting clarifications given by way of circular. So friends, we discussed very clearly that recipient can happily claim input tax credit if the conditions specified in section 16 are clearly satisfied where we discuss some interesting concept that he must have a tax paying document, he must receive good services or both, supplier must pay tax to the government, recipient must file return. If all the conditions are satisfied, then only he can take input tax credit. And of course, credit should also reflect in GSTR 2B in order to claim the credit. Now, let me tell an interesting concept, my dear friends. That is, they have introduced a fantastic rule known as Rule 86A, which specified that a registered person would have happily claimed the credit, but commissioner or any other officer authorized by the commissioner not below the rank of assistant commissioner may restrict utilization of that input tax credit. That means that input tax credit would not be allowed to be debited from electronic credit ledger. The logic of this point is very simple. If commissioner or any other officer authorized by the commissioner not below the rank of assistant commissioner is of the opinion that credit is ineligible or credit is fraudulently availed, then they may restrict the debit of that balance in electronic credit ledger. That means in simple terms, they will not allow you to use that balance in electronic credit ledger. If they have a reasonable belief that credit is ineligible or credit is fraudulently availed. Now, the big question which comes is, what is the meaning of this word having a reasonable belief? That reasonable belief cannot be based on feelings and emotions. So, for that reason, they have clearly clarified that any of the following reason could be regarded as a reasonable belief. Now, what is that? Point number one. Supplier is found to be non-existent or 
supplier is not conducting business from the place of business mentioned in registration certificate. Second possibility, recipient is found to be non-existing or he is conducting business from place other than the place of business mentioned in registration certificate. Third possibility, credit is availed without proper invoice or a debit note. Point number three, there is an invoice or a debit note but credit is availed without actual receipt of goods or services. That means just invoice is given but there is no goods or services involved. So in any of these cases my dear friends, the commissioner or any officer authorized by the commissioner not below the rank of assistant commissioner can restrict utilization of the balance in the electronic credit ledger. One more possibility also is there that credit is availed by the recipient on those invoices or a debit note for which supplier did not pay the tax to the government. We know very clearly that important condition that recipient can claim credit only if supplier has paid tax to the government. Very, very crazy and interesting point. So if supplier is non-existent or recipient is non-existent or there is invoice but no supply. Fourth possibility, there is supply but no invoice. Fifth possibility is that supplier has not paid tax to the government with respect to that invoice or debit note. So in any of these circumstances, commissioner or any other officer authorized by the commissioner not below the rank of assistant commissioner may restrict utilization of input tax credit. That means they will not allow you to debit that electronic credit ledger. That is the story of this interesting rule 86 capital A.